Lent. We are just about done with Lent. Wow. This is the sixth Sunday of Lent, and we've gone through all six. And we've been trying to follow um, Lent in a, in a different way. We wanted to be able to look at Lent not from a negative point of view, not through a negative prism, but the affirmative action, shall we say, of clearing the decks. You know, Lent was always, when we were a child, about when we were children, about denying self, about letting go of things, about giving things up. And it was understood as penance for sin. But how about the idea of letting things go, clearing the decks in order to be more present, in order to be more aware, in order to be able to see through the distractions that life naturally presents, but also the distractions that we create for ourselves, mostly in our own minds, to step away from that constant monologue in our heads, to step away from the, the things that we habitually do that have become so rote, so ritual, that we don't even think about them anymore, and we're not present through them to whomever or whatever is in our path at the moment. So we've been looking at, 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 at Lent in this way, trying to say, okay, how can we continue this contemplative life, this contemplative lifestyle, to move toward the new life, the rebirth, that Easter represents. And so that's what we've been talking about doing. And we've been taking some of the days of Holy Week and saying, liturgically, each day of Holy Week has a name and has a set of scriptural passages uh, designated to it traditionally for, for a thousand years at least. And each one of those is telling the story selectively of the last week of Jesus' life before the crucifixion and the resurrection. But if we dig deeper and we take a look at how those stories were selected, which ones did the church fathers select? And maybe some church mothers too. Which ones did they select and why did they select them? Because if we look at the meaning underneath there, it is not only giving us a surface meaning of the events of this last week of Jesus' life, but it's giving us a deeper meaning that's directed at each one of us, each one of the followers of Jesus. In terms of how do we actually experience the progress along Jesus' way? This way of his that he said is the only way to the Father, the only way to kingdom, the only way to the truth that makes us free. All of those things, and if you think about it, all those things are Father. Father is truth. Father is awareness. Father is presence. Father is those things, the truth, the freedom of kingdom. And so Jesus' way is a way of getting there. How is it experienced? Well, each day of Holy Week is giving us a glimpse into that. We talked briefly about Palm Sunday, and we're going to talk more in detail this morning, that Palm Sunday is about seeing past the expectations, the agendas, the drives, the compulsions and obsessions within ourselves to see what's really in front of us, what we were just talking about. How do you do that? But if we don't do that, how are we going to take any further steps along the way. Fig Monday, we talked about, instead of seeing past our own distractions and our own agendas and drives that take us off track, is to see past those that are part of the institutions around us, the groups around us. See past our own church's distractions. And that was sim symbolized by the cleansing of the temple and the cursing of the fig tree. And then Holy Tuesday and Spy Wednesday were all about the balance between living here and now, and still the expectancy of life to come, what is coming around the corner, staying balanced in that. And the balance between the macro and the micro, which better we can understand probably is the balance between doing and accomplishing and simply being, kind of the Martha and Mary. So those two days, the stories there between the, the, uh, the wise and the foolish bridesmaids or virgins and, and the stories of Judas and Mary are all about balance all about watchfulness and readiness, staying balanced, staying aware. And then Monday, Thursday is all about unity, whether it's in the Last Supper, the institution of the Eucharist, actually taking into ourselves everything that Jesus is. It's about the prayer for unity at John 17. It's about the washing of the disciples' feet, which shows that the master is a servant and the servant is the master, and the two connect in this beautifully unified way moving into Good Friday, which is a complete surrender, the consummation. And then Holy Saturday is the rest, and then Easter Sunday is the rebirth, the ascension, the coming back in a new way, coming back 
to life, but different. And so each one of those days is giving us this roadmap and this way through everything that we're talking about. And here at the beginning of Holy Week, though, what we want to do is spend some time now with Palm Sunday. Because Palm Sunday is the first day. It's also the first step along this way. And Jesus is constantly hammering this point home constantly trying to get us to understand. And he uses all different types of imagery, all different types of metaphor, word pictures to try to get this one point hammered home. What does he say? He says, well, listen to the patter of little feet, he says. (laughs) Now we know where our kids are and they're safe and they're having fun. He said, unless you sell everything that you have, And give it to the poor and follow me. You can't go where I'm going. Sell everything you have. He said, unless you lose your life, you can't find it. He was saying, he talked about the sign of Jonah, which is the descent into the belly of the whale. He talked about denying yourself. He talked about picking up your cross, which is a metaphor, of course, for letting yourself, your desires, all of your egoic mechanism, let it die. Put it up there. Everything that he's talking about here in all of these metaphors, stories, teachings is trying to get us to the same point. There is a built-in block for us as human beings, simply because we are self-aware, simply because we're, we're, we're conscious in a way that animals aren't, that blocks us from seeing the truth, blocks us from seeing what is right in front of us. And unless we take this first step, unless we can break down our over-identification with all of that noise so that we can see what's right in front of us, no further steps along the way are possible. And so this first one, I mean, is any one step any more important than any other? I suppose not. They're all getting you where you're going. But the first step sets the foundation, the ground rules, the rules of engagement, if you will, for everything that is to follow. And so it's vitally important that we understand what is Jesus talking about when he talks about Palm Sunday? What is the story talking about when he talks about Palm Sunday? Now, when Jesus emphasizes this, he emphasizes Palm Sunday as a tragedy. And that's kind of counterintuitive because it looks like a triumph. In fact, that's what it's called, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, right? But he calls it a tragedy. Why would he do that? Why does he consider this a tragedy? He says it in Luke, and we'll read that in a little bit. But this was a missed opportunity for the people. The people missed the hour of their visitation. The people missed who Jesus was. They were looking for something else. And so they missed the opportunity to make a radical transformation, not only in their personal lives, but in the collective life of their nation. And this is what Jesus was trying to get across to them. If you stay on this path, you're going to be destroyed. And they absolutely were, just 40 years later, absolutely destroyed and leveled by the Romans. This is the path that they were on. He said, but if you can make this change, if enough of you can get your heart lights turned on, it'll change the corporate collective direction of the entire nation. This is what he was trying to get across to them. It was a missed opportunity to see something radically different that would make a radical transformation in their lives. And of course, it kept them on track for the destruction. Jesus keeps pounding the point. He keeps trying to get them to understand. But this is the significance of Palm Sunday. This is what he's trying to get across to us. Seeing the truth of things as they are by seeing through all of the things that would block us, seeing through what we think is significant and missing the things that truly are. Let's take a look at the way Mother Teresa puts it, because I think she just does it so beautifully. If you have your inserts, take a look at that first quote there, and you can read along. She says, I have an opportunity to be with Jesus 24 hours a day, seeking the face of God in everything, everyone, all the time, and his hand in every happening. This is what it all means to be contemplative in the heart of the world. Contemplative in the heart of the world, I love that. Seeing and adoring the presence of Jesus, especially in the lowly appearance of bread and in the distressing disguise of the poor, each one of them is Jesus in disguise. Wow. 
If she's right, what is she pointing to? What she's pointing to is an unassuming God. Think about your notion of God. What, is it, what does God look like to you? Is it some grand figure up on a huge throne? Is it parting clouds and rays of light coming down? She's saying that she's seeing God in the face of every one of those filthy, dying persons that she held in the houses of the dying in Calcutta. She was seeing it in every God, in every happening, every face. Things that we would just go right on by because they seem insignificant to us. But she was taking the time. She had tuned her awareness to the point that she was seeing God everywhere. Just like Brother Lawrence that we've talked about so much. An unassuming God. A God who rides into our lives in ways that we don't expect. With a visage that we don't recognize. And so we might miss. An unassuming God. Are you ready for an unassuming God? Are you ready for a humble God? A God that is washing your feet? I mean, this is what Jesus is trying to get across to us. And it's so counterintuitive. It's so radical. Some of you might be feeling that it's blasphemous right now, what I'm trying to say. But take a look what is happening in the Gospels. Take a look at how Jesus is trying to bring these things across to us to get us to understand until we can let go of all of our preconceptions, until we can let go of all of our biases. We can't see what's right in front of us. Close your eyes for just a second. I know we did this before, but this is just a little case. Close your eyes and picture Jesus' face. However you imagine Jesus. Maybe you're standing on the seashore and here he comes walking up to you. What does he look like? What's the shape of his face? What are the colors of his eyes? What's the color of his hair? What's the length of his hair? Have you got a good image in your mind's eye of what Jesus looks like to you? All right. Now open your eyes and look at the little picture on your inserts. How close were you? (laughs) You see, we have impression, not that this is what Jesus looks like, but you know what this is? This is a forensic recreation. You know how they they take the bones and then they they create the depths and they create all the the layers of of muscle and, and fat and tissue and they recreate what a first century man in Judea or Palestine would have looked like from all the different archaeological digs that they've been able to put together. And the average man in first century Palestine was five foot one. The average man in Palestine weighed 110 pounds. The average man in in Palestine had very close cropped hair and close cropped beard. Paul even says, disgrace for a man to have long hair in one of his letters. If that was Jesus, and you know, but did he look like the average man in Judea in that time? We know that we, the, the authorities had to hire Judas in order to point him out in a crowd. So if he were six foot, blue eyes, long straight hair, I think he would have stood out. <laughs> they would have known. Can you handle a Jesus that kind of looks almost like a hobbit to you? <laughs> Could you handle that? And remember what Isaiah says. Take a look at Isaiah 53, 2. For he grew up before him like a tender shoot. He's talking here about the Mashiach, the Messiah. And like a root out of parched ground, he has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him or appearance that we should be attracted to him. Could you handle Jesus if he weren't attractive? Could you handle Jesus if he didn't look anything like you imagine him to be? Or would you walk on by looking for Tab Hunter. (laughs) It goes this basic. I know this is just trivial. This is just skin deep. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. Think of if that is what we believe of just how Jesus looks. How much else have we got buried down there of our own ideas, expectations, and absolutes about who God needs to be in order for him to be God for us? These are the things that we need to take a look at. Are we ready to recognize Jesus as he rides into our life, right here, right now, today, in whatever form he takes? Are we ready to see the significance 
in the insignificant and recognize the moment of our visitation? Or are we going to miss this opportunity as well? Now, Palm Sunday for Jesus at this time, just a few days before his crucifixion, everything's coming to a head right now, all right? Palm Sunday is sandwiched in between Lazarus Saturday, which we don't talk about too much, but that's about the raising of Lazarus from the dead, and between Fig Monday, which is about the cleansing of the temple, where he goes in and actually overturns the tables and calls the place a den of thieves. And so if you think about it, raising Lazarus from the dead, Lazarus Saturday, is the height of his fame. At this point, people are going crazy for Jesus. The crowds are growing. They're following him. He's getting noticed by all the authorities in all the wrong ways. And he's sandwiched in between Fig That and Fig Monday, which is the height of his threat to the power, the powers that be. This for them is the last straw. When he goes into the temple at this time, at Passover, when the, the, the city is just filled to the max with all the Jews from all over the area and the region, this is the last straw. So everything is coming to a head. It's the Passover. It's Pesach. It was one of the pilgrimage festivals. All Jews were commanded to come, at least the men, to Jerusalem to fulfill their ritual obligations. And Jesus was an observant Jew. He did this every year. His family did it every year. His disciples are begging him not to go. They know it's too hot. They know what's going on. Even before he cleanses the temple, they know that the knives are out, and they're begging him, don't go this time. It's not worth it. It's too risky. But of course, he goes anyway. And he knows what he's walking into. He knows he's walking into a meat grinder here. But he goes anyway. Because that's who he is. That's the integrity of who he is. And so when he gets there, let's read the way Matthew puts it. At chapter 21, verse 1. Now, when they all drew, drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you just say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put them on their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the highest. Okay, this story is filled with symbolism and filled with prophecy. We need to break it down a little bit so that we understand what's going on here. I mean, obviously, the first thing that we see is this donkey. What's going on with the donkey? What's the significance of the donkey? And then the foal or the colt of a donkey, what's going on there? In the ancient world, kind of pretty much throughout the, the ancient Middle East, the horse was a symbol of war and the donkey was a symbol of peace. If a king rode into your city on a horse, look out. He's coming in to make some noise. If he comes in on a donkey, that means he's coming in peace. He's coming to negotiate. He's coming to find truce. To come in on the colt of a donkey, the foal of a donkey, is even a lowlier status. By choosing the donkey, Jesus is saying right off the bat, I'm not who you think I am. If you, who you think I am is the one who's going to throw the Romans out, I'm coming in peace. What about these palm branches? What's that all about? Also throughout the Middle East, palm branches were the symbol of triumph and victory. It's what the people waved to the returning king who had conquered the neighboring city-state, whatever. They would wave that to them to put the palm branches down in front of him, to put their cloaks down to create a red carpet effect, it is to show their homage to this victorious ruler. And in Jerusalem, in, in, in Israel, the date palm was also the sign of peace and plenty, of prosperity. And so all of these effects are going through. We have the donkey. We have this, this mixing of, of, of these, these symbols being layered up. We have the prophecy that comes from the Old Testament scriptures being reenacted here almost verbatim. And what is going on? Why is all of this being 
layered up for us. We have Hosanna itself. And most of us think of Hosanna kind of the way we think of hallelujah. Hallelujah literally means praise God, praise Yahweh, praise Yah. And we think of Hosanna being used in the same way here, but really Hosanna is a Latinized version of the Hebrew Hoshiana, and that comes from Psalm 118, Hoshiana Ana Yahweh, which would be, save us, we beseech you, O God, O Yahweh. Save us, we beseech you. So this is what the people are crying out to Jesus. He comes in on the colt of a donkey. They're waving the palm branches of a triumphant king and shouting, save us, we beseech you. And so the question becomes, save us from what? What is it that we're looking to be saved from? Well, the people and the zealots, the zealots, the kanaim, the ones that were looking to destabilize Roman power. They were actively fomenting riots and assassinations and anything that they could do to destabilize Rome. And they were looking for this leader, this warrior king, who was going to really galvanize the revolution and kick the Romans out and reestablish Israel as a sovereign state. The people and the zealots were looking for that warrior king. They were looking for that Mashiach who was going to do exactly that. And one was basically coming on every other hill in Judea. There was always some incoming, you know, claiming to be that ruler, wanting to start the revolution. And of course, the Romans were pretty fierce about putting these guys down in no uncertain terms. And several had been put down. And crucifixions were handed out like parking tickets, of course, during those times. But that's who they were looking for. What about the Pharisees and Sadducees, the actual rulers of, of the Jewish state? the ones that were connected with Roman power. Well, they saw Jesus as a threat to their power base. They were looking to be saved from Jesus. They were looking to be saved from any destabilization of the status quo because that was the source of their power over the people. Whether it was the temple itself and the temple mechanism and its workings, or whether it was the law, the way the Pharisees had interpreted it, either way, when Jesus overturned those, those tables, he was putting an ax to the root of both of those systems at the same time, and they knew it. And they knew that the people were all over Jesus, and so something had to be done. What were the Romans looking to be saved from? The Romans were looking to be saved from any type of sedition. The Romans were looking to be saved from any type of destabilization. The Romans were looking to protect their tax base and the flow of revenue from all of the provinces in. Rome has often been called a soulless empire really didn't have a lot of philosophical, religious you know, meaning to their empire the way the Greeks did. They were just about order, stability, and the flow of revenue. The IRS would be proud of these guys, especially tomorrow, wouldn't that be? And so they were looking also to be saved from any destabilization, or especially for Jesus, from Jesus to foment an actual revolution, get that in order. And what about the fourth group, Jesus' followers themselves? What were they looking to be saved from? They were looking to be saved from anonymity, if you think about it. Just in the preceding chapter to the one that we read here, we have the story of James and John sending their mother to Jesus. Don't you love this? They send their mother to Jesus to ask Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, can my boy sit at your left and right hand? <laughs> after all the years that they had been following. And of course, this, this is, creates outrage among the rest of the 12, right? That they would do this. And so big bickering and fighting is going on and who's going to sit at Jesus' ref? And Jesus is riding it on a donkey. Jesus has said over and over, this is after what, three, maybe four years? Who knows how many years of following him? And they still misunderstand. They still don't understand what Jesus is about. They're still looking for him to come into some kind of temporal power, and they can then move into the big time, finally, from the back of beyond in the Galilee, from their anonymous, meaningless lives as fishermen or shepherds or whatever they were, to be able to come to the fore and have a place of power. Do you see how every one of these four groups that were shouting and screaming at Jesus' entry into Jerusalem was seeing him through their own prism, through their own desires, through their own agenda? They were seeing 
what they wanted to see for, this, for themselves. They were seeing a reflection of themselves that had nothing to do with Jesus. And the irony here is this cry of save us misses the entire point of salvation. Jesus isn't riding in to fix things for them. Jesus isn't riding in to change their circumstances to their liking. Jesus isn't riding in even to save them in some sort of passive way. Jesus is riding in to show them who he really is, to show them who his father really is, and most importantly, to give them an invitation to find out for themselves. Give them the invitation to take the first steps down the path of this way, this only way, to the Father that will bring you in contact with the truth that will make you free. There's nothing passive about Jesus, ever. Jesus is an absolute radical force who will never leave you unchanged if you really see him as he is. And that's the problem. If we're only seeing what we want to see, if we're only seeing what our obsessive compulsions demand us to see, we will never realize that God has already made his choice about us, and it's time for us to make our choice about him. What are we going to do? How are we going to proceed? How is Jesus writing into our lives? Can we look beyond our needs and our fears? Because we do the same thing, don't we? We have these set ideas about who Jesus is and how he's supposed to operate in our lives. And it keeps us passive. It keeps us back on our heels. This real Jesus is pointing to something completely different. Our fears keep us in place. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid of that keeps you from being able to just see what is right in front of you? Are you afraid of change? <laughs> that means you're invested in the status quo if you're afraid of change. Right? You've got some investment there. Think of the Romans. Think of the Jews. Think of the Pharisees and the Sadducees invested in the power. They needed things to stay exactly as they were because that was a source of everything that they needed. So how do you know if you're invested? How do you know if you're afraid of change? Well, think about this. How do you react to something new? How do you react to something different? Something that comes out of left field. Are you immediately offended? Are you immediately distressed? Do you immediately go into debate mode and start fighting for your position against the position over here? Or can you just be intrigued by something that comes from a different place that maybe you hadn't considered before? Can a smile start to play across your face? And a motivation to want to learn more about what's going on here. Check yourself. Check your offense meter. What offends you? What outrages you? Because anything new that hits you like that means that you're invested in this and you're not ready to let go and you're not ready to see what is right in front of you. On the other hand, are you afraid of not changing? Well, then you're not invested, you're marginalized. You feel that life has passed you by. You feel like you're on the sidelines. You feel that you are not in the circumstances that you need to be or want to be. How do you know if you're afraid of not changing? Well, are you bitter? Are you angry? Are you envious? Is it really, really difficult for you to just enjoy someone else's success because you don't feel you're in the place that you're supposed to be? And you're looking for a way out. You're looking for a way to change those circumstances. You're looking for Jesus to pull you out. You're looking for Jesus to keep things the same. It's our fears that will dictate to us our ability to be able to just see Jesus as Jesus is, see this moment as the moment is. Either way, again, we're only seeing ourselves. We're only seeing our compulsive needs. Never Jesus. Take a look at what Jesus says at Luke 19. When he approached Jerusalem, Jesus approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it. One of only two times that the Gospels record Jesus weeping. 
he weeps over the city. Then he says, if you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side. And they will level you to the ground and your children within you. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time, the hour of your visitation. And that's exactly what the Romans did in 70 AD. They surrounded the city. They threw up a barricade. They breached the walls. The people starved inside during the siege. And when they finally got inside the city and they were trying to get the gold out of the temple, they set fire to it. And not one stone was left upon another as they tried to get the gold, the molten gold out. This is the path that they were on. Jesus is trying to get them to understand there is another way here. There's another way that you can go through. This tragedy of not seeing the opportunity that they had at that point to make a turn individually and collectively is everything about what we're talking about here for our own lives. How do we react when Jesus comes into our lives? Would we recognize Jesus if he were standing right in front of us? Sometimes we think, mm, we'll know him when we meet him in the next life. We're going to know Jesus then. But will we? Look what Richard Rohr says. Prayer lives in pure, open moments of right here, right now. This is enough. This is fullness. If it is not right here, right now, it doesn't exist. If we don't know God now, why would we know God later? If we don't see God now, would the eyes be prepared to see God later? The mystics say no. We will not recognize God later if we cannot recognize God now. It's a matter of seeing God now through the shadow of the disguise. God is here. God is now. We say we know that, but we have all these preconceptions and rules about what God can be and can't be that keep us from being able to just move into that. If we haven't become a people prepared to see God in our lives as God rides in each moment, how do we think we're going to see him in the next life? This is what it seems Jesus is pointing toward. And so many Christians for 2,000 years who have moved into that space all say the same thing. This moment, not the next moment, this moment, can I see God now? Can I connect with God now? Because if I can do it now, I will do it then. If I can't do it now, then there's something that I have not let go of. There's something I'm still carrying around that keeps me separated from my very God. Rohr continues, the real question is, what does this moment have to say to me? Those who are totally converted come to every experience and ask whether or not, not whether or not they liked it. Those who are totally converted come to every experience and ask not whether or not they liked it, but what does it have to teach me? What's the message in this for me? What's the gift in this for me? How is God in this event? Where is God in the suffering? Now, this is one of the hardest things that we can do to just approach a moment for what it is and not judge it, not try to conform it, not say, oh, it shouldn't be this, it needs to be that. Just let it be what it is. Let it teach us. Even if it's a hurtful moment, let it teach us. Immerse in it anyway, because God is in it anyway. Even if it hurts, can we approach all our moments like that? Can we approach our moments with that kind of connection, with that kind of unity? This is where all of this is leading. How do we know this Jesus? Who is this Jesus? Take a look at what Jesus himself says at Matthew 25, verse 37. Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, truly, I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of these, 
He did it to me. What is Jesus saying? He's saying that the Father, He, are all around us every moment in everything that we see. Can we become that aware, that present, to see God's action in every moment? Or are we going to keep trying to run it through the filter of what we think we know and miss the hour of our visitation? The truth is God is always writing into our lives. Every moment of our lives is Palm Sunday. Every moment, here comes Jesus writing into our lives. Always. Not to the expectations that we have, but humbly, in humility, on the colt of a donkey, prepared to wash our feet with a kind of humility that is hard for us to even think about practicing ourselves. And yet this is what Jesus is saying is the characteristic of his father and what he himself practices. And he's telling us, by selling everything that we have, everything that we think we know, being willing to lose our lives, lose what we think of ourselves, lose what we think our identity is, denying ourselves, accepting life's crosses and taking them on and moving through them, we will become people who will not miss God riding that donkey into our lives. And we will know that we've been visited and it will transform us radically from the inside out as we move on this trajectory to Easter Sunday, which is the new life. One more time, Mother Teresa, see if her words take on new significance after this last 20 minutes. I have an opportunity to be with Jesus 24 hours a day, seeking the face of God in everything, everyone, all the time, and his hand in every happening. This is what it means to be contemplative in the heart of the world, seeing and adoring the presence of Jesus, especially in the lowly appearance of bread and in the distressing disguise of the poor. Each one of them is Jesus in disguise. Let's pray. Again, Father, we are so grateful to be here. Thank you for preparing this new home for us. Thank you for preparing it in time for Holy Week. And thank you for our community. Our community that makes a safe place for us to be able to practice and, and move about and be vulnerable and do the things that we're trying to do here. Father, you know how frightening it is for us to let go of our our expectations, to let go of our images. And so having this community around us gives us a place to be able to do that and know that we know that we are accepted even as we move through all our gyrations as we're trying to come to you. Thank you for always writing into our lives, never, ever leaving or forsaking us. Help us to see what is really right in front of us and who you really are, so that we can move into the new life that you have for us, even as we immerse ourselves right here and right now. Thank you for being that kind of God, Lord. Thank you for your love. Never let us forget. We can only love because you loved us first. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand.